Hello and welcome to another edition of PM Express and this is the business edition. My name is Philip Nanfuri. Now today's conversation is going to be very interesting. We have one thing to do. How do we invest? Where do we invest? How do we spot a smelly rat in the investment world? Today's theme is based on a discussion or today's discussion is based on the theme investing in Ghana. Where are your investments safest? Is it under your mattress? Is it in the bank or is it in the safe? That's what we're going to do on tonight's show. In the course of the past uh, weeks, we've seen a lot of discussions on investments. Words, Ponzi schemes, pyramid schemes have been bandied around a lot. How do we spot them? Where do we actually invest? When you make your money after a hard month's work, where do you put the money? Bank, treasury bills, what? Bonds, what is it? We are going to do that in today's edition. And we are going to look at also an important part of investing. How do you know that what you are actually putting your money into is the right thing you are putting your money into? So we'll take a quick break. When we get back, we'll start our discussion. Yeah, welcome back. My guests for tonight are two important bankers in our society. One is an investment banker, and one you can describe as just a banker or a commercial banker. My first guest, Frank Kwache, he's the MD of Dauphin Finance right here in Accra. And Mahama Idrisu, he's an investment banker. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me on PM Express, the business edition. Thank Pleasure you. to have you here. Thank, thank you. you for having us. Thank you, thank you. So I'm going to start off with you, Frank, right off the bat. One thing that seems to bother us in this country is when the month ends and we take our disposable income or our salary or whatever it is, we want to put that money somewhere to work for us. There's always the line between savings and investments, and you hear a lot of people confusing the two. Some use the words interchangeably. Is there a real difference between savings and investment? Yes, I would say so. There is uh, a difference between savings and investment. I will start by saying that when we say you are saving, preferably you are putting the money aside to preserve the capital or to preserve that money. For instance, you have money that um, you want to put aside so that you don't lose the value of the money or you want to keep that money for a rainy day. And what we normally tell people when you are saving is like you're putting money aside for a specific purpose. So you don't want to lose the value of the money and uh, you don't want the money also to, I mean, lose uh, what I call its purchasing power in the end. But when we talk about investment, that's another thing altogether. Investment means that you are bringing in a, a little element of risk. You want to risk that money with the intention that you are going to grow that money or you are looking for a bigger return or you're looking for something to be added onto that money. So in the simplest term, savings is preserving what you have Investment is putting the money to work or looking to earn something on the money. Okay. I have a very interesting question here. Um, uh, one of my colleagues asked me just before I came on the show. If you put your money in a savings account in a bank and they give you, let's say, 1% to 2% interest, yeah. would that be considered a savings because there's a name savings account attached yeah. to it or it's an investment? Yeah, generally, savings accounts don't pay so much interest, and 1% to 2% is um, what I would say is a norm globally, uh, not only in Ghana, because um, in North America where I've had the opportunity to be there, I tell people that um, there's a tax-free savings account where the taxman doesn't even tax you on your income, and you'll be surprised to find rates even more than 2% on that. But when we are talking about investments, you are expecting to earn something over and above. So in general terms, normally what you earn on savings could even be below the inflationary rates that is prevailing. But in developed countries where inflation is just about 1%, 2%, mm -hmm. thereabouts, it's like you are hedging against inflation. 
that's what savings is all about. So will I be right in saying that a savings account, as we have in our Ghanaian banking system, is not an investment? It's not an investment. It's just money you put aside. Yeah. And in, then... in, in our normal banking setting, there is savings and there is fixed deposits. The fixed deposits are considered investments because they pay a return higher than what you would have, I mean, gotten on your savings account. And that also locks you in for a returner. I mean, savings, you don't have to get a tenner. You can walk in and take your money out. Anytime. Anytime, any day. Gone were the days when we have notice accounts where you have to give the bankers seven days or 14 days to go for your savings account. Now with ATMs and with online transactions, the money can be in the savings account. Tomorrow is moved off. So, I mean, it's like literally savings is a hedge just against inflation. Okay. Idrisu, um, last year there was a story on Bloomberg uh, at the beginning of the year 2018 when it says our uh, stock market was outperforming global stock markets. We also saw last year, 2018, that uh, rates on treasury bills were declining. With this definition of savings and investment, following from this, if I had money and I went back, if it was possible, to last year, I will look at where I will make the most money. Treasury bills were doing around 13 to 15 percent on the average. Equities, they say, is risky. Apart from these two that people are accustomed to and the fixed deposits he's mentioned, where else, if you're investing, can you put your money within the Ghanaian context? If you can give us some global ones, then we narrow in on the Ghanaian context. Where can we exactly invest our money in the Ghanaian market? Thank you. Um, in this country, we have a lot of investment avenues of products. What everybody knows is a fixed deposit. Uh, we have bonds that are issued by uh, the government for two years, for one year, for three years. So one of the avenues is to contact your bank, probably invest your money in government bonds. And that will probably depend on the amount that you are talking about. Now, apart from the government bonds, you've already mentioned the treasury, which is now, when people say treasury bills, me and uh, Frank, Frank think that the ordinary man thinks that uh, our normal 91 day uh, investment. Yeah. But when you see them quote government securities, you see 91, you see 182, you have even 364. 364 is there? Yeah, they put it as kind of treasury bill yeah. this thing. The moment it is short term, that is how it is described. So okay. even in the treasury bill, we have the various maturities. Okay. where you have the 91, we have the 182, and we have the one year. Apart from that, the million term to long term, which is the two years and above, are normal government issued bonds. And when government issue bonds, everybody is free to buy. And yeah, you just need to contact a primary dealer to be able to, to buy it. Having said that, other investment that you can do is maybe you want to be an entrepreneur in an industry that you've got money you want to go in there. You know that one, you are now the shareholder, so okay. shareholders are the last people to get returns when the company is dying. So you take the risk and you carry the risk. Having said, I want to go back to Frank's distance. Okay. Savings, just like he said, when you think up about getting commercial returns on your money, which involve risk, that's when you are talking about investment. The moment you are not expecting commercial returns on your money, and you just want to preserve the purchasing power of the money, then it becomes savings. And most savings are directed to a specific aim or objective. Investment can have a variety of aims that it has to satisfy. It is only when it grows to a certain point, that's when you do your diversification. Maybe I want to pay children's school fees, I want to buy land, I want to build. But savings actually leads to investment when some people think that the money is too small to be able to do any meaningful investment. Now, there are other industries you can put your money in, apart from being an entrepreneur. We have a lot of businesses around that if you want to invest, you can invest. What we are talking here is that people will be looking at just money market instruments okay you have mutual funds that are available these mutual funds are giving out a lot of return the only problem is that you don't just walk there and pick the money some of them have the cash out uh what do you call it uh 
penalties cost. Cost. Maybe they say you have to invest for up to two years before you can get out. But having said that, if the mutual fund has done 25, 26, and you just have to lose 2% or 1%, what is your problem with it? <laughs> you will still be making a return better than maybe the inflation rate or the treasury bill. Or you can still have up to 4 5% real return. That actually shows that you have beaten both inflation and you have beaten both the GSE and the treasury bill benchmark. So investing in, in that area is also available. Um, I always advise that you invest in licensed products by okay. the regulators, whether by the central bank or by the Security and Exchange Commission. That is what have a lot of supervisory and reporting guidelines and internal audit procedures that will prevent people from misusing the money when it's available to them. So there are a lot of things you can, you can do uh, with your money. Okay, so fixed deposits from the banks, treasury bills, bonds, shares, you can invest in companies. If you, if you have a, a friend, a colleague who's running a business, you yeah. can pump money in there. There are a lot of mutual funds. For mutual funds, uh, yeah. which uh, they describe it as a collection. Yeah, collective investment schemes, yeah. yeah. Okay. Collective investment schemes. There's, there's a very important question I want to ask here. When you mentioned treasury bills, 91 day, 182, 364. I see when people are trying to invest in treasury bill, there's always the perception that this 91 day let me let me let me let me reframe this people always look at things per annum yeah so one year so they take for example uh, let's say the treasury bill is around cities uh-huh so you have 100 Ghana cities and, and then the rate is let's say for currently it's 14 percent yes 14 percent so therefore but you will not get 14 percent so can you can end. you explain that for okay, us okay let me explain that the 91 day treasury bill the rate that is quoted is per annum. It means it's looking at the whole year. So if you invest for 91 days, what is simply going to happen is that it's, you're going to do some calculation to say that we're going to say that 91 days divided by the 364. So in actual fact, you're getting a quarter of the 14% that we have quoted for 91 days. For the 91 days. But if you decide that you want to be a little bit astute, after the 91 day, you want to roll it over for another 91 day. If you roll the 91 days over for four times, then you're going to get a 14% with a little bit of compounding effect on that for you. But if you just hear, like, currently, 182 day is uh, 15%. 15 Invariably, it means after 182 days, you are getting seven and a half. So it's actually halved. You're getting seven and a half. So if you go for one year, which currently is 16.5, then you'll get a 16.5 on your 100 Ghana cities because you are, you, you are in for one year. But 91 day, any rate that is given to you, divide by four. 182 day, the rate that is given to you, divide by two. So that you know exactly what's you are getting so that you don't feel that um, the bankers have deceived you because they quoted things um, per annum and when you went for your money the money that they gave you on your as your return it's not what you anticipated in investment world i always tell people that ask all the questions and the person who is selling the product to you is duty bound to explain all the things that goes with that product, more especially the risk inherent in that investment products that you're going for. Let me just let me let me just chip this in. Our financial landscape is awash with a plethora of institutions, with banks, finance houses, savings and loans. I'll take your point, Frank, and I'll come to Idrisu. Do you think the people who are manning these desks, like for example, customer service desks? have the necessary knowledge and experience to explain to somebody who is uninitiated in finance or economics whatsoever that's okay you know what when you come in and they say 91 days 15 percent it's not 15 percent for the year it's this and this do you think we have that i'll say strictly no i've been a banker before and i have seen the gaps and i'm still a banker i always say that i've seen i've seen gaps in the communication that is given to people, ordinary customers that have walked in, that 
they are not giving the whole picture. And even some, I mean, at some decks, you have people struggling to find the information that they need. They need to maybe call somebody to come and explain what it's all about. But when it comes to investment, I think that what the banks or the finance houses and the savings and loans should do is to get a dedicated person, well knowledgeable, to explain some of these things. It's not just something that the customer service people can just do. I mean, they can give the ordinary information, account opening forms, do this, do that. But when it comes to explaining what goes in there, I think they must get a specialized, unit a specialized person to come out and do that kind of explanations. Why do I say that? I mean, you'll be surprised that you walk into a bank today in Ghana, you might ask a few questions about investment products and other things, or you might, some banks that are even doing bank assurance and other things, and you find out that the information that you'll be given is shallow. Okay, so I see, I, I see here there should be a lot of um, education coming from the financial institutions. Exactly. When we return from the break, I will find out whether it should be the role of the regulator or it should be the financial institutions themselves who should take it upon themselves to educate whoever is in charge of explaining. Because you've heard it here, the 91-day, 182-day 90 Treasury bill is not as simple as the rate. So, for example, you have 100 Ghana cities, 15% 91 day, and then it's 15% of your 100 cities. No, you've heard it here. So anytime you go to an institution, ask the relevant questions and other parties are the people who are in charge of these desks. Can they give you the right answers? This is PM Express Business Edition. My name is Philip Nanfuri. My guest, Frank Wachi, MD, Daphne Finance, and Mohamed Jisu, an investment banker. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. Thanks for staying with us. My name is Philip Nanfuri. This is PM Express Business Edition. Before we go into the break, we're looking at some small calculation. I know a lot of people don't like math, especially at this time. But it's important that we understand the fundamentals underpinning investments for Soreva. And when you go to a financial institution, please ask the relevant questions. Don't be shy. It's your money that runs them, to be honest with you. So ask the relevant questions. I wanted to know, before going to the break, is it the regulator that should be ensuring that the people who are manning these desks are educated? Or the banks or the institutions themselves should take it as a task educate their people to ensure that when you and I step into a financial institution, we are given all the information we need. So I'll cut straight to Idrisu and I'll ask him, should it be the regulator or regulators that should ensure that the institutions are giving their staff members the right training or the staff members themselves together with management whatsoever should take it as a task to educate? Let, let me break this thing into the various regulators. Let me start with investment banking. You go to the stock exchange for all the courses. You pass, you write the exams and pass. The courses will teach you the practical way of calculating things or advising people. The SEC issues you a license. So anybody who is setting up must have at least two people who are licensed. One, either to trade on the stock market or an investment advisor representative. Now, when people go to an office, they find front desk people advising them. And they probably don't have licenses. Anybody who go to an investment banking firm, whether access management, whether issuing house, whether advisory, whether a brokerage firm, insist you want to talk to a licensed officer by the Security and Exchange Commission. If you say that, they'll get you somebody who's licensed because it's a crime for someone who's not licensed to advise somebody either to buy into uh, shares or to buy mutual funds because you have to be told the good, the bad, and the ugly. And you, the investor, upon hearing everything, just like Francis, everything, whether the good aspect or the bad aspect, the risk involved, then you then make an informed decision. And when the fault, any fault comes, you are the one who took the decision, not the person who is advising you from the Bank of Ghana side or from the Insurance Commission or from, look, it is a duty of the organization to train their officers and get well-managed, well-trained people who understand the products that they sell and people who have client service attitude 
to be able to attend to people. Look, a friend told me he went to a bank. He wanted to ask about how to buy Forex on his account. He asked 16 questions, and all the 16 questions were referred to somebody at the back. That's tedious. Can you imagine the young lady sitting there couldn't even answer any of the questions? Well dressed, nice jacket, fine lady. So what do you do in a day? So when you get up a day after close of day, what do you say? I went to work, then you're going home. Who did you just make happy for being a client service officer? And 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 I I, would, I want to bring this in here. It's a it's a it's a personal experience. Life insurance. I'm sure everybody has had a brush with a life insurance agent mm -hmm. or sales agent. Now, when they come to you, they, they are more or less in a hurry for you to sign without any explanation whatsoever. And to be honest with you, sometimes it's, it's very irritating when you are asking questions about the policy and they don't seem to answer. They want a quick. And I personally had a brush with one uh, sales agent. He met me up. When I asked him one or two questions, I told him I want to keep and read before I fail. Yeah. He never called me back. Yeah. Because they know you come and ask exactly. the right questions. He, he just couldn't wait. He was in a hurry for me to just say, oh, I should just sign your boss. Wait, yes. No. And, and, and it seems it's going on and on and on and on in the society. People who are in charge of these institutions don't seem to have the necessary knowledge. And some institutions that take their staff out to train don't train them also in some of these things that they're supposed to know. So you enter an institution, bank for example, and it's, they, they've been trained in a particular way, give you the answers, and that's it. Beyond that, they, sometimes they can't even explain to you what exactly you are looking for. You, you know, Ghanaians don't like reading. Okay? And so, the people take advantage of that. You know, all the bad information and the disadvantage of every product is at the back of the page. Mm -hmm. And we don't read. One of the companies that are in trouble now, I did my due diligence. I know when you open their website, you see the form. Nice grammar from head to toe. When you read the back, and you actually understand investment, that's when you start running. Look. I, those days, I wanted to have a feel of all kinds of investment. That's when insurance products came up. So I actually took an insurance destined. The initial one was one of the biggest insurance companies. And so they would let you write a check, and then they would go and pay in. So the subsequent one is taken from your bank account. That's cool. I mean, After six months, I went. I met the young lady, just like the front days. Well, I'm coming to check. Uh, and those days, I like this guy, so I was in my shorts. Okay. I want to come and check my insurance. I did it in February. That was February 2007. Then he checked. He says, oh, there's nothing in there. It's just the check that I wrote. And I said, oh, what is happening? Oh, but don't you realize that when they are deducting, you don't see that they deduct? That was the first statement. Can you imagine at that time, you are deducting 25 cities from probably somebody who earns 15,000. How will he know that 25 Ghana cities has been taken? Yeah. Apparently, the director of finance has, is actually my colleague. So when I, the moment I called him, the lady started shivering. I said, I'm not here to let people sack you. But he said, you don't talk to people because you don't even know me. If you make me fill bank details for somebody to take money from my account, you, you don't ask me, I should go and look at my bank statement every Find time the month exactly ends. No. What's going on? And that's the problem we have. Some of them are, in, uh, what do you call it, selling agents. Yeah. Yes. So there's pressure on them to sell. To sell. Because you have to sell a minimum to be able to earn a certain amount. The commission. A commission. And, and, and Frank, quickly, how should we correct that? Bridging the line between the, selling it, it comes, and the actual education yeah, of the comes financial products. So like he rightly pointed out, in certain jurisdictions, investment advice should only or must only be given by licensed or authorized advisors. For instance, um, in North America where I've had a privilege, if a person gives you his business card, 
you can maybe see at the back of it that investment advisor. It means he's licensed to talk to you. you you'll be surprised that most of the front decks or what I call customer services people that we have, the criteria for selecting them is a good maybe facial expression. The person can smile speak and the person grammar. can speak grammar. But when it comes to finance, or when it comes to banking, it's a specialized area. So you need to train the people in a way that they will be able to represent the institution. So it is the duty of the managers of the institution to train their staff adequately to be able to sell the product. I once worked for a bank, I don't want to mention names, okay. but Every product that is put out there, there is what we call a product program. That the product is described, the returns that people can make on it, the risk inherent in there, and possibly maybe the liquidity challenges of that particular product. So it goes through circulation, and then training is held for the front staff walk them through, scenarios are made, role plays are held, so that you can, em you can envisage every question, but you can envisage what I call the frequently asked questions to be able to do that. I don't expect that a front desk person will know everything, but I yeah. expect that 90% of the product knowledge, they should have it, to be able to tell you about the product, and should be able to tell you about the risk inherent and should be able to tell you the return or the cash value to get. Some institutions, I know when you walk in there and you ask, they will ask you all the questions, they just punch a few things, they will tell you from their calculator screen and show and share with you and tell you that this is how much you're looking at. So that you have it at the back of your mind, but it is the organizations that are supposed to do it. The regulator can only do so much by coming maybe once a while to check on whether staff have been trained adequately, or maybe if they do mystery shopping to find out if mm -hmm. the institution has got people who are manning the decks to be able to do the thing. Then they can write maybe their regulatory report and say that, you know what, they think that the training should be upgraded or the staff training is not adequate. And then the institution should take it upon. But the institution itself who is selling the product must be able to have people at the front decks or people to be called to be able to give out every detail about the products that they are selling. Other than that, you don't have um, the sales team. Okay, I see, I, I see there's, a, there's a depth of uh, education from both sides. Yeah. We, the customers, and then the institutions that are providing the services. Yeah. That brings me to a very important point. Again, from a colleague. Guaranteed returns. I know in the investing world, from the SEC, it's, it's a no-no. Frank, why yeah. shouldn't an institution promise me 22% on my investment? Why is it not a guarantee in the investment okay. world? Then you have to know what type of investments that you're talking about. If it's a fixed income, you should be guaranteed a rate. In fixed income, you mean? Fixed incomes, I'm talking about fixed deposits, I'm talking about bonds, and I'm talking about maybe treasuries. Okay. They should give you a yield. They should give you a rate that you're looking at. Because nobody will walk into, I'm saying I'm buying a bond and I don't know the yield of the bond. Or I'm doing a, a fixed deposit or term deposit, depending on where you are coming from, to say, I don't know how much I'm going to. But when it comes to equities, or it comes to fund management, fund management or like my friend said, in this country, you can be a speculator, you can decide to do currencies, or you want to do commodities, they can't guarantee a rate. The performance of the fund for the previous year does not in any way guarantee what is going to happen in the current year. At best, they can tell you the performance of the fund or the performance of the product in the prior year. But there should be a caveat somewhere to say that it does not necessarily guarantee that you're going to earn that same what, return in this year. So, yes, the SEC is right by saying that if you're a fund manager and you are 
investment person, and it's not fixed income products you are offering, you can't guarantee any rates. But for the uninitiated, for the uninitiated you enter a bank and then you ha they have on their screens yeah. fixed deposits, maybe between 2%. Yeah. yeah. Why can that is a fixed deposit. That's a fixed deposit. Yeah, that's a commercial so bank. That's a commercial. Uh, bank. That's a commercial bank. So if you went somewhere else, um, like for argument's sake, um, I can use my friend um, in Data Bank. He walk into Data Bank. Okay. Because I know I mean Kojo. Kojo is a good friend of mine. Okay. Under no circumstance should Kojo tell you that. Give me hundred Ghana cities and I'm going to give you twenty two percent. It's a no no. Okay. For, I mean, he's maybe EPAC or for his he yeah. can't do he that. He can't do that. But if you walk to Daffin Finance, you walk to Standard Chartered, fixed deposit. They should, and they can't tell you that I'm taking your fixed deposit Without giving you and I'm not rate. giving you a rate. Yeah. The two institutions are different, and are the different. products are different. Okay. That's why I said, if it's fixed income, there must be a guaranteed rate for the fixed income product. Like, let's even narrow it down. Government of Ghana Treasury Bill. Every week, they published how much the rates are yes. for the week. So it's a fixed income. You know how much you are getting. But if it is a non-fixed income, and the non-fixed incomes are the ones that I've told you. It could be commodities. It could be mutual funds, like you said, funds of funds. It could be equities or shares or, I mean, uh, stocks. Stocks, yeah. You can't guarantee any rates in there. And that is what I call pure, pure investment. Because you're going in, your return could be 1,000. Your return could be 5,000, depending on your tenor. Or your return could be zero. And you could even lose the principal when you're talking about pure, pure investments. Pure investment. Okay, so that would be, with your data bank example, data bank is an investment. It's an investment. Bank. Yeah. But when you walk into a commercial bank, now it's we have 23 thing. of them. Yeah. They can tell you that, okay, for 91 days or for three months, six months, we're giving you 23 percent yeah. of your funds and ask them whether the rates that they are quoting is a per annum okay because when sometimes people walk in oh what are your rates oh 91 days 23 the next question you ask 23 what is it per month uh, okay per annum then you know exactly yes. what the person what has quoted traditionally interest rates are quoted per annum but you should be able to ask because we have an era now that people are quoting monthly rates <laughs> and then you have issues of people saying that, well, I wasn't given all the facts, but you have to ask. This, this, I like this because 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 it's uh, it's put things into perspective. People walk out there uninformed of the issues, and they just jump into anything that we said. Then, okay, you know what? So we're going to do this, and then uh, this institution says uh, you bring us hundred thousand and above, and we'll give you this and this without any. Um, without any understanding of what it is. Um, my colleague went round to speak to people. Uh, when it comes to this whole, let me just broaden it, Ponzi schemes and what's going on. And the whole world of investing. And it's, it's shaking people a bit. We, we are conducting the poll, joy business. It's not done yet. But from what we're picking up, people haven't lost their appetite for investment. Uh, I would have thought that with all this shady stuff going around, people would have shied away from investments. So we we'll, we watch a video um, put together by my colleagues uh, at Joy Business on some people's perceptions about Ponzi schemes, investments, and stuff like that. Why not to sit down Chris Kelly and analyze? Because DKI came and could not do anything. And, and, and men's good came and people, a lot of people try to invest, put their money in there. It's a matter of choice, it's risk. People have taken their risk. A lot of people who put their money in men's good were able to recoup. Others couldn't. So I believe it's, a, it's an option. So if a company should come promising, let's say, 120% per annum, what would you do? It's, it's too outrageous. Investment, their money in I don't think I'll try any form of investment anytime soon with all that has happened. I'll stick to the banks and my small susu box, which I trust. So they say money boss, and I say media investment. So this issue that came up is really frustrating people. So I wouldn't want to go there and lose my money too. If any other company come up with such thing again, I won't do it. 
For now, let this issue let get down, then I'll have to start over with another thing. But for a quick investment, if, I'm, if I have anywhere to invest my money that is very sure, I'm very sure about it, then I'll have to go for that one. Then make my money, then just go. I blame the government for the low confidence in the sector now. I believe it's government's duty to fish out all the companies operating Ponzi schemes so that some of us do not fall prey to such schemes. Because of all that is happening with men's gold, I don't think I'll do something like that. So what right now would you say is the best option? I'd rather put my money at the bank. Know that at least a safe there, no dubious pretense. Yes, and then I'll know that if there's any problem, Bank of Ghana will sort us out. So you've heard it from Ghanaians, the mixed views on investing. How one little scheme can rock the entire foundation to the financial services industry. Where will you put your money? Let me ask you. The bank? The safe? Or you put it in your mattress? Cut your mattress up, stuff your money in there. What will you do? I'll find out for my guests. Frank. Interesting. Uh, what <laughs> I'll say is that while people should not lose hope in investing, um, investment is something that I think everybody should contemplate or do at one point in time. Why do I say that? Because it gets to a time in your life that if you're working in the former sector, you'll be retired. And I know for a fact that you'll be paid a pension, but a pension might not be enough to take care of all your needs. Because it's on the average, it's been proven that you need between 70 to 80% of your retiring income to survive. And if I'm should go by currently what is going on in the market, depending on where you find yourself in, uh, in your work environment, now in Ghana, you might stand a chance of getting 50% of your best three salaries or you might get 35%, depending on which time you join the social insurance uh, or SNIT pension, and that's the tier two yes, and other true. things yeah. that have come in. So people should not just say that because one investment has gone bad or one company has gone bad, um, naturally every investment person or investment organization out there is bad. You have the banks, like they say, but the banks, the return they will give you you must understand it. It's a lower return, like we started. If you just want to put the money in the bank for savings, then you know what you're going for. If you want to do fixed deposits with the bank, you must know what you're doing for. If you want to go to the finance houses and go to the savings and loans, to get a little more beyond what maybe the treasuries will give you, or you just want to do treasury bill, you just don't want to worry your head about anything, or you want to do equities. But at the end of the day, all I say is that if you have to do investment, ask and seek advice and build for yourself maybe a portfolio get yourself an investment advisor investment i always tell people is like your health why do people go to the hospital some go just for normal checkup if you have an investment advisor or you have an investment i will say that every year you have to go and see the advisor to find out about what is happening in the market how well have my portfolio done but people don't do it I know people, some who have just bought shares and kept the certificate somewhere and uh, don't worry anything about it. The company might be doing well or the company might not be doing well. You need to find out all these things from an investment advisor. I tell people, some people will still do self-medication. Mm -hmm. I'm sick. I walk into the pharmacy. I tell the pharmacist, I need amosaslin, I need that, I need that, which is not safe. But people will still do it. There's one thing that we cannot cure there will still be Ponzi schemes. Why? Because we can't cure greed. Okay. Very important point. We can't cure greed. In the heart, in the heart of North America, where it's still developed, there are still Ponzi schemes. Why? Because some people will naturally want to take some risk. You can't stop them from taking that risk. But they must understand what they're doing. If the person understands perfectly what he's doing, and he says, yes, I want to go for it, I'll be good, but there will still be the vulnerable people in there who I think that's the best thing for them to do is to seek investment advice 
so that they know exactly what they are doing. But we cannot say that because of what is happening in the current, in the current environment, scheme. investment is bad. No, we cannot. Idrisu, we heard from the, the, the last lady who spoke in the video. She says she's not going to try the investment. She's going to take her money to the bank. I know you're an investment banker. You have experience. Does this shake you a bit, what's, what's, what's going on? Or you are fine, your money is going to be in the bank and not in the safe and not in the mattress? No, you know, investment is such that when you get hurt, you have to go back, sit, and re-strategize. That's all what investment is. Just like Frank said, you know, Ghana, we just don't like taking advice from professionals. Yeah. We like taking advice from friends, brothers and sisters <laughs> who don't even understand what they are telling. Look, I have had an, an a situation where my brother got nine million, went and bought a taxi. <laughs> and it collapsed. And me, I am sitting advising people, no, advising the public, public about what to do about investment. And, and then money. when he loses the money, he comes every weekend and takes 50 Ghana. <laughs> that's that's what that's what Ghanaians are made. But if somebody had told him that this nine thousand, I'll give you eight thousand in the next six months, you go and put the money there. Then the France said, we can't we can't cure greed. Look, do your homework, do your due diligence about yourself, the aims, what you want to achieve in future, and sit down and say that look, this is what I want to do. I have to go to an investment advisor to structure something for me. Ask the investment advisor where you are telling me to put my money. If you have money, will you put it there? I said, yeah. Those days I used to sell share, I tell people, if you want me to see my advice, ask me if this is your money, will you put it? And I'll tell you straight, this IPO, I am not going to buy it. Because I don't believe that you give me the return that I, are looking I for. am looking for. Okay. But this is the good, the bad, and the ugly. Look, people should not give up. All what they need from banking to savings and loans to investment banking. I keep telling people that even if you bury fruits and go after 100 days, you still find very hard ones, you still find very ripe ones, and you still find very rotten ones. Ask the questions, how, when, what, and you find the answers from licensed and professional advisors, both from banking and investment banking side. Okay. And you will not make a mistake. Okay. So, we've learned an important lesson. We can't cure greed. But when you walk into a financial institution, please ask the right questions. And like Idrisu said, and I saw Frank alluding to that, the person who is investing your funds, ask him if that's where he's also putting his money. This is PM Express Business Edition. My name is Philip Lanfumi. We'll be right back. Welcome back from the break. Uh, my name is Philip Nanfuri. This is PM Express Business Edition. So we've had a very fruitful discussion, if I may say so. We've looked at the difference between savings and investment. Investment, your money is actually working for you. Savings, you're putting something aside, maybe perhaps for a rainy day. Investments, like my guest said, are going to give you commercial returns. We've also looked at the education of the actual investment products, the staff and the institutions which are selling these products to you and I. They must ramp up their, their understanding of the, of, the, of the industry or of the products. Because it would be very poor for you to walk into an institution and you're going to be ill-advised. And like, we, like Idrisu said, get the person who is actually investing your money. Ask him, is he investing his money, his own personal money, where he's taking your money? It's critical. And like Frank said, greed cannot be stopped. You can't stop somebody from being greedy. But you have to open your eyes to make sure that where you're putting your money is the right place. So I'm going to find out from them. We've just begun the year a few days in. It's a long one ahead of us. What does the investment landscape hold for you and I, individuals? Let's forget the corporates. Let's think about you and I. Where can we put our money? Treasury bills, is it going to go up? Should we do some equities, stocks or shares? Should we do bonds if you have enough money on you? Where should we put our money? I'll start with Frank. Okay, I'm not going to prefer any specific, specific solution. Uh, investment okay. advice, but what I say first is that 
before you consider investing, let's look at your age and where you find yourself. Okay. Then the returns that you are looking for. The first point of the first point of call or where you start from is what is the risk-free rate? Where is the treasury rate? Currently, let me use one year rate. It's 16.5 thereabouts. If you don't want any risk, and it varies from individual to individual, just go get yourself some risk-free products and stay in your corner quietly. But if you want to take some risk, you can look at whether I want fixed income. Like I started, you want a guaranteed one. Mm -hmm. But fixed income, the advice that I give people is that any fixed income product currently, or your benchmark is that any fixed income product, that gives you more than 12% above a risk-free rate, be ready for the inherent risk. Okay. If you want to do equities, you can go in there. I think two years ago, the stock market in Ghana did very well. But I don't think last year it did so much. Okay. But things could change this year. People were talking about activities rebounding and businesses picking up mm -hmm. in 2019. Nobody knows what mid-year could tell us okay. or going forward. But what I say is that take some risk but get a portfolio. Okay. Don't put all the eggs in one basket. Baskets. Yeah, true. Diversification. Diversification inherently what I call it's got an insurance premium in there. Okay. If I have, let's say, for argument's sake, 1,000 Ghana cities, I might say that on the average, I might want to put maybe 500 into fixed income, 500 into equities, depending on my age. Okay. If you are older, your risk profile or your risk appetite should be winding down okay. but if you are younger you can take some risk you can take some risk okay because if you are younger your investment horizon should be longer okay for the long term if you want to do the long term then look at some equities okay. i tell people that i find it very interesting when i hear people saying that i'm going to go into the stock market maybe for one year and i get out no. you'll get your fingers bent it might not happen unless maybe you're going to even if you do just the index there's a likelihood that the whole index itself might not turn out what it's supposed to be okay. anybody going into the stock market should know that the horizon should be a little longer i give people let's say three years to five years okay and then you get out but for fixed incomes you can do 91 days so okay. it depends on your horizon okay how you're looking and how much return you are looking out for okay but your bottom line or your starting point should always be what is the risk-free rate now? Okay. Idrisu, your points in yeah. 2019. Uh, Frank has already said some of the things that I've said before I okay. come to what I want to do. So I want to just give a summary. Look, okay. I start from risk-free. You don't want to take risk. Even though... When was that in Argentina? Government couldn't pay treasury bills to people. That's that's a special case. <laughs> <laughs> so Ghana, we haven't come across that. Yeah. So if you want risk free, go for it, lower it, or you go for banks. They can give you savings interest rate. You have the base capital available. You can hedge against uh, the purchasing power of your money. Okay. If you want to take some risk, you can try finance houses, savings and loans. But you have to make sure that you do your due diligence. You can On get 34% yeah. above uh, treasury. treasury. Yeah. Some of them are excellent. Even with this financial trouble that is going on, some of them, do, they don't even read the news because it doesn't even apply to them. Okay. So do your homework well. Make sure that you get one of them. You can get some 3 4 5% above treasury. Now you can try mutual funds. But you have to make sure that you know the philosophy of the mutual fund. Some of them are percentage equity, percentage money market. Others are full money market. Uh, okay. Those that are percentage equity, check the portfolio of equity that they have. Um, I keep telling you that the stock market, when they say 
the all share index is negative. Look, there are actually some stocks that are doing 60%. Yeah. Okay. It depends on the kind of investment advisor you are using. So check the mutual funds, look at, they publish the returns. So it's easy to actually check which one is giving uh, year to date better return. And then you can invest. Okay. If you want to, like if you know your horizon, if you can calculate your risk tolerance level, you understand the stock market you can do it okay five pro frank probably give three to five years you can even do 10 years we have a cyclical distance okay three years it goes down it comes up to three years it goes down. some years depending on the fundamentals of the economy uh we say we have very good fundamental economy but the stock market actually went negative uh all maybe because you know the banking sector holds a chunk of the all share index. yes yeah and this year is not good for banking. Okay. I've, I've seen some researchers say that 2019 the bank is very good for the bank. But me and Frank know that it takes one year for the benefit of capital to be realized. Yeah. So that's 2020 we are looking at. Okay. Yeah. But you can still go into some stocks that Which are, are good. not banks, yeah. okay. but they can still make returns. Even some banks can still make returns, okay. but you need how to get a better advisor. Okay. You have to diversify. Okay. Okay. So, one check your age or your horizon. If you're younger, you, you have a longer investment horizon. You, you have more years, so take some small risk. And then if you're getting older, don't get into too risky investments. And always make sure that you do your due diligence, like you just said. So I hope this conversation has made you better informed. When you go out there, please make sure you check everything out. Ask the right questions from the investment advisors whatsoever. And make sure that where you're putting your money, is actually safe. This has been PM Express Business Edition. My name is Philip Namfuri. My guest, Frank Kwache, MD, Daphne Finance. He's a banker. And Mahama Idrisu, an investment banker. Gentlemen, I want to say thank you very much for your time. And you, my viewer, listener, thank you very much.